Hello out there. This is Pamela Fagan Hutchins. That's Eric, not Fagan Hutchins, my husband. He's going to keep me from getting boring tonight um, as I talk with you guys. And I am the author of Livewire, which is one of your Pulpwood Academy bonus picks for this year. It's a romantic mystery, and we're going to talk about Livewire, books, and reading, and writing, and life in COVID, and whatever else we feel like talking about tonight. And I'm going to give away a lot of prizes because that's how I roll. Lots of ebooks, lots of audiobooks. I hope to entertain you and keep this really engaging. And I'm going to turn it over to Eric for a second while I take care of some housekeeping to tell you a little bit about where we are and maybe even weirdly enough about um, who his wife is. <laughs> maybe your, we'll get there. Who's your wife? I'm not sure yet. <laughs> so we're coming to you from a hand hewn log cabin that is. Uh, at 6,000 feet on the face of the Bighorn Mountains uh, near Sheridan, Wyoming. And the place is incredible. It was made, uh, built by one family over a period of about two years and it, and it was built as a bed and breakfast. And in addition to the awesome family of Fagan Hutchins that lives here now, uh, I won't drop any names, but a lot of uh, famous okay. authors came, oh, drop, come through here and, drop some names. and, and stayed here uh, when it was a B&B. And so this place has soul. In fact, the first time that Pamela and I uh, came to look at it, she turned to me. The first thing she said was, I could write here. And uh, here we are. Yeah. And, um, and Pamela, uh, her connection to this area is that uh, during some of her early formative years, she was uh, raised in a little town called Buffalo. It's about 30 miles south of here, um, at Buffalo, Wyoming. And in fact, she told her parents that they ruined her life when they moved her away from here. And so she's been, she's been plotting ways to get back to this part of the country. Uh, pretty much ever pretty since. Pretty much ever since. Yep, that's correct. So housekeeping is done. How did he do? Um, comment and let me know how you think my assistant did here. Um, so here's what we're going to do tonight. I think that it's super awesome that you guys in Pulpwood Academy get to do online book club, especially with COVID going on. It's just, it's the way that we have to do it, right? And you get to chat with and engage with authors of the books you're reading, which I never got to do when I was an avid reader. And I think that's super cool too. But I think it's even more fun if we talk together. And so I'm gonna be encouraging you to leave comments tonight. And in order to do that, I'm gonna give prizes for those comments. I'm gonna give away eBooks, give away audiobooks from my entire library. First, we're gonna start with the Maggie books, of course. And at the end of tonight, I'm going to give away a doozy of a prize. You don't want to miss this one, I promise. What I hope that you will do is answer the first one for me because we're going to practice. I'm going to give you a prize basically for breathing, but I'm not going to actually go through and pick the winners until a day or two from now when everyone's had a chance to look at the replays of the video and answer the questions. By the way, this is live video, so you're going to hear our dogs. You may hear people walking around in the house because we're not alone. We're keeping it real. So here's how you answer the first question. Type a one. That's because it's question number one. And to enter to be chosen, just tell me, number one, the city and state you're joining me from. Easy enough. And I'll choose a winner of the um, whole set of Maggie Killian Mysteries, Livewire, Sick Puppy, and Dead Pile from somebody that answers that question. And by the way, these questions aren't gonna be hard. They're gonna be about you. So it's not gonna be about me or about my books. You're gonna have no problem whatsoever. Unless, I don't know, unless- No problem. No problem? Yeah, no problem. Okay, so enough about that. Let's talk a little bit about, um, let's talk a little bit about books, about writers, about, well, this writer. Um, me, let's talk about me. It's all about me. Um, first of all, what do I write? Um, well, I write a super series called the What Doesn't Kill You Super Series. Super series. I may or may not be drinking a refresca as we, as we do this video. And the super series is thriller, suspense, and mystery. All the characters are interrelated. So in addition to, for instance, Maggie in the book that you've read, um, being from Wyoming, you're going to have characters from other books in the series appearing in her books and her appearing in other books as well. I like to do that. It keeps me on my toes. And I am somebody that obsessively writes real characters. While it's thriller, suspense, mystery, I think the comment I get most is that they're pretty... Um, 
they tend towards literary mysteries in that they're very character driven, but I try to keep them light because I want them to be entertaining because that's what I like to write. And as I said earlier, it's all about me. So we get back to that point. Um, and in addition, they're very outdoorsy and adventurous, the ones set in Wyoming. Again, no surprise. That's it's kind of how my life is. Um, in fact, on the uh, Pulp Academy site, I shared a bunch of pictures of me writing. And mm -hmm. when I was looking through for pictures of me writing, every single one was outside, which kind of made me laugh. It's like 1,100 different places, and I'm outside in every one. Um, I am a rugged independent, as are some of the protagonists in my books. And yet, I have an agent who wants to turn me into something else, and we'll see if he's successful. Um, but when I wrote Livewire, it was very much about a particular story. So I do want to share with you that particular story. I'm going through and I'm seeing the comments. Way to go. People are leaving their answers. Yes. We've got our, I can just sense winners all over the place. <laughs> it's just a, it's just a big group of winners out there. Pulpwood Academy. That's what we would have expected, just right? Just Ah, Tito Bandito uh, just walked in. He's one of our dogs. So maybe we'll find one that can be picked up and go on video in a minute too. So when it came to time to write Livewire, I'd already written Maggie into an earlier trilogy within the Super Series, and I loved her, but I didn't know what I wanted to write about her yet. The muse had not yet spoken. And then when we were living in our Texas house, um, I would, Eric was traveling, and one day I was out feeding the horses and the donkeys and the goats and running around with the dogs. I was actually fixing a little bit of fence. I was being a cowgirl, being a farm girl, and I came back into the house, and there was a man in there, and he ran out the front door, which should have scared me, but instead it made me mad. I had a gun on me, turned out, by the way, and a uh, spoiler, it wasn't loaded. But I felt all tough, and I went and checked the house out to make sure no one else was there. And then I, I am Derek and said, oh, by the way, there was a guy in the house when I came home, but don't worry about it. I've got a lot to do today. I'm just going to get working. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get writing. And he was like, are you crazy? check the attic at least. And at the point at which he said, check the attic, I realized that both of us were crazy <laughs> because I shouldn't check the attic. I should leave and I should call the police. Well, trying to make a really long story short, over the course of the investigation into the guy, it turned out I had a stalker and that the guy had been following me a lot longer than I realized. And by the way, if you thought it was cool to have someone that interested in you, if you've had it happen before, let me assure you it isn't. I'm sure some of you have. And so I very much was then changed forever. Uh, I felt very violated by the guy being in the house, by the fact that he'd been basically in a little nest outside my bathroom watching me for about six months. And, um, and I, I needed to write it. So in March, Maggie, and I, um, I ended up writing a story that really was um, based upon that experience. Um, at the time, we were living near Brenham, Texas. We still have a house there, and uh, it is so cool, and I love it. And now, of course, we're full-time here since my husband's retiring. So, with no further ado, I think I should move to the second giveaway. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so number two is, write a number two with your answer, so I'll know it's for number two. And this one will be, grab me, um, Vanna White, grab me Fighting for Anna over there. This one is gonna be to give away the first book that Maggie appeared in. Oh no, you're Vanna, you hold it up. Oh, there you go. Failing already. I know, he's so cute. Um, it, this is Locked the first words. book that Maggie <laughs> appeared in. It's called Fighting for Anna, and it's in an earlier trilogy in What Doesn't Kill You. And if you will please tell me what your favorite genre to read is, you can be entered to win that book as well. Did you, Vanna, like the Maggie books yet? Someone said, welcome, Vanna. <laughs> they did not. <laughs> yes, they did. Right Seriously? Yeah, <laughs> that says Vanessa. I'm rocking this thing. Oh, dang, I thought it was... <laughs> Oh my gosh. But they did ask where you lived in Texas, but I think you kind of covered that. Yeah, it was actually... But, but you've lived all over Texas, and that, yeah. and, and that is at the heart of some of your other books. It is. I, I, I like to write about places that I have a strong connection to, because I like to write about a setting that informs the way the characters are going to behave, and even informs what the mystery or the suspense will be about. So I've written books set in Houston. Uh, the Brenham area, Dallas area, Corpus Christi, um, all over Texas. 
New Mexico, um, Wyoming, the Virgin Islands, New York, where else? I think it's fair to say you get deep enough into the, the location that you try that they become a character in, in most yeah. in mo most cases, or at least components of the area become an integral part of the story. Very much so. I feel very very strongly about um, the way in which, especially the history of settlement and religion in a particular area really makes a difference in the story and changes how people interact with each other. So for instance, when we first meet Maggie, okay, so we don't first meet her in Livewire, we first meet her in Fighting for Anna. And Fighting for Anna was a book where the, the primary driving force behind the story was that in this little area in Texas, there was a um, wind community. The Windish were refugees from let's call it Germany, but in the 1800s, and they were refugees who were seeking religious freedom. And so they were running away to try to establish a community and get away from the Germans, and then ended up in a community where Full they Germans. were most like the Germans, <laughs> and so that's who they really became um, uh, connected to. But it was a really restrictive religious environment in some ways, and so our character in fighting for Anna had run away from this religious community and ultimately um, that's what drove um, the mystery. So I like to dig in like that. But I also enjoy, for instance, in the Maggie books with Wyoming, to me what Wyoming is, is, is it is that constant, is it the hero or is it the bad guy? Because it's beautiful and it's rugged and inspiring, but the weather and the, and the terrain can really be killers. And sometimes you can really amp up the tension and suspense by using things like that. Whoa, I'm falling behind on the comments. Keep going, honey. And you're, you're really good. interested in, in the Native American versus settler history and that the good and the bad of that and the way that the story can be told from either direction and and there's so much i use the word soul again but around here so much history here that's really really powerful if you get into it yeah and when we again are thinking about maggie and and thinking about this area where these books are set um maggie discovers that she is as much crow as you are northern arapaho Go Arapaho. So Eric is part of Arapaho. But Maggie discovers that she is um, a little bit crow, which she hadn't known. It makes her feel a real affinity for the area. And it, when we first moved up here, what we were hearing a lot from people was with how close the different Native American cultures were to the land and to, um, to the animals, and that they felt like uh, there was just a stronger spiritual connection that lived beyond their lives. So everybody had their sighting story. Eric and I have ours as well, a couple of them, um, where people believe that they have experienced or seen um, people from long ago, Native Americans from long ago. And so that made its way into this story. The Amish culture made its way into this story, which was because of, well, this is a funny story. Yeah. Right, go for the go, yeah, go for the story. Okay, there's an Amish community north of here in Ashland, Montana. We were looking to have somebody come and build a fence on our very steep property on the face of the Bighorns, and nobody in Sheridan wanted to do it. It's steep, and as my dad would say, they don't call them the Rocky Mountains for nothing. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Sorry, in, inside joke. Inside joke, but oh. um, and so we were looking for someone that wanted to do this work, and were um, referred to uh, an Amish family, and we went and met with them, and they said, "Sure, we'd be happy to do it, but you got to come get us on a Monday morning and bring us home on a Thursday night, and put us up for the week, and feed us while we're there, because we don't drive." And we can't come back and forth, it's two and a half hours away. So for a couple of weeks, um, a few summers ago, we had an Amish family that would come and live with us in this cabin, in this cabin um, one week at a time. And that went so well, they came back and did other things with us. And we just really, really had a great experience with them. And so I was writing Livewire at the time, so no surprise, the influence of the Amish community and the way in which people in the Amish community will commute down here and work in this area made it into the book. And I had a lot of fun with that throughout the Maggie series. So yeah, that 
you know, the, you don't have the same kind of murder in my books that you would have in Manhattan when you're in Wyoming, right? So one of the things, Eric and I storyboard together, which is super fun. Eric's a good idea guy. He is a butcher of the English language. Can't, can't write a sentence, can't spell, but he's a great idea guy. And so we storyboard, and, um, and I'll always say, okay, give me a new way to kill somebody. Sometimes I've already come up with them myself. We'll be walking around, and I'll go, I could kill somebody with this. This would make a great murder weapon, and, you know, there a story idea is born. But usually my story ideas come more from the culture, and then we work to look within that culture and that setting for what would be the best way to off somebody. Dead so, pile. yeah, dead pile. So the third Maggie book, Vanna, Vanna, please. Um, the third Maggie book is a dead pile. And we were, a couple summers ago, we have big draft cross horses. Um, they're so cute. I wish we could have them on video. They would like to come in the house, but the floors would break. Um, we have big draft cross horses, and one of them does make it into the Maggie books, and that would be Katniss, the character, the horse named Lily, is based on my Percheron on Mare Katniss. Anyway, we had our horses at this ranch called Piney, uh, Little Piney Ooh. Ranch. I was going to call it Piney Bottoms. That's the ranch in the book. <laughs> so we were at Little Piney Ranch, and the, um, the guy running the ranch, we were just sitting around chewing the fat one day, and um, we asked him about this big pile of dead animals that was on the back side of the ranch where we'd been out riding. And, and we said, what happened? Was it a lightning strike or did you have a plague? You know, what was it? And he said, well, that's my dead pile. You got to have somewhere to put them all when they die. And actually, that's a Texas accent, but I just yeah. automatically segued yeah. into it when I said rancher. Um, he said it pile. more like, out past the creek. What else do you think it is? Yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <a dead laughs> so um, we, um, we said, well, what the hell is a dead pile? And he said, it's just where you put your dead animals and then you know, nature takes its course, or occasionally you go out and have a burn or whatever. And my first thought was, what a great place to hide a dead human body. And so that's where Dead Pile was born. Yeah, we didn't have to work for that. I mean, conversations like that all the time. We were at the dentist the other day, and they were laughing about, so are you going to put us in a mystery? You're going to kill us? And and I said, yeah, the dentist gets killed under a snowplow or something like that. And he goes, oh, no, no, no. And in Wyoming, everybody knows that the way to kill somebody is the three S's. You know those, right? Don't you, Pamela? And I went, uh, no, yeah, maybe. And he and his dental hygienist, and this would be Sarah and Kevin, in case they ever watch it, at the same time said, shoot, shovel, and shut up. So that's in my Welcome current book. Welcome to Wyoming. <laughs> yeah, that's in my current book. So you had a question there okay. um, about the, the walls, or all the walls like your back wall. You can and tell them I, about that. And I want to bring you back to the start. Okay. Be, because you, I, I think people would be interested, you know, what, what grabbed you about Maggie? Why, you know, in the Ooh, Michelle books, yeah. where did it stand out? And then what, we, what were you trying to do with her? Why, why did you choose to write her instead of write one of the other characters? So the answer first about the walls is, yeah, this is a real log cabin. It's a big one. It's a lodge. We actually run a lodge here. But these are hand-hewn logs. The cabin is about 25, 30 years old. Yep. Built by, you, you mentioned this up front, that it was built by one person. Um, but that's what it looks like. So it's Everywhere. really rustic and, and it's cool. It's spectacular. It's also quirky. You'll turn a light on, one comes on in another part of the house. A couple minutes later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so why Maggie? Well, for starters, Maggie has good taste in clothes. Johnny was. That's what I'm wearing tonight in honor of Maggie and booze. This would be Coltiska, which I can't do this. Whoops. Coltiska. You can only get this in the mountain states. But she is um, she's brash. She is wild. She is wounded, really, really wounded, and does, as a result of this wounding, and newsflash, she's a wind, she's an escapee from the wind culture, like her mother, um, she does some really, really questionable things. She's like the, the friend you can only go out with every so often because she just wears you out, but you have stories to tell for a really long time afterwards because she's hilarious and does things you would never do. Well, that's Maggie. And people loved her in Fighting for Anna. And I wondered if I could do a full book with her without wearing myself out. And um, I actually fell in love with writing her. She's a hoot to write. And, in, and, and okay, so my mother. This mm -hmm. is a set it, all over the place, right? We are, this is what talking to us is like. My mom is my second reader. This is all authors, right? You have your spouse or your best friend or your writing partner and then your mom. So my mom's only comment when I'll say, Bob, were there any 
problems or issues with that first draft that I let you read is she'll circle in red all of the cuss words and say, was that necessary? <laughs> was that necessary? And if it's an F word, oh. then it gets a big um. <laughs> That's um, our shepherd over there, our German, Melja Malamois yawning. She gets a big red circle because we're not allowed to use the F word ever, except if you're Eric. She loves Eric. He can say whatever she, he wants. And she said, please don't use the F word in your books, at least not your protagonist. And that's good advice. I did that for 12 books. 12 books. <laughs> Maggie said, F no, basically, <laughs> I'm going to say the word. Now, I don't mean to be offensive here, um, <laughs> but Maggie can be offensive, but not horrible. The books are not overtly sexual. She's not dropping F-bombs all over the place, but her dog is named that word with an ER on the end. So anyway, I give this book to my mom because that's, and trust me, it's funny and jarring at the same time. So anyway, I give this book to my mother thinking she's just going to say, oh, Pamela, I can't, I can't. I'm going to have to change my name and you know move <laughs> to South America to get away from the shame of you using the F word in your books. And instead she said, this one was my favorite. I said, mother. I've waited 13 books to be able to have Maggie speak, and I was so scared to give this to you. Anyway, so Maggie does use some, um, some uh, colorful language. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody just, uh, uh, yeah, Betty does know the dog's name. Yes. <laughs> so uh, the, um, the dog is based on one of our dogs that's deceased, and, um, and I do tend to do that a lot with characters. I base them on somebody I know, um, whether it's an animal or whether it's a person. So with Maggie, I had an assistant um, once upon a time who's back in the music industry. She for briefly got out of the music industry, and she was a whiskey swelling, f bomb dropping, absolutely magnetic personality, and I just. She and I don't, we still keep in touch. It's not like we were best friends or anything, but I was just like, I want to, I'm going to write her down before I forget it. And that's where she came from. So we've got my horse, we've got my dog. And I'd like to do the third question, but then remind me, because I'm going to tell them about writing things true, which is a real problem when yeah. you're, when you kill people in books. So do you want to do the third question? Uh, what if, uh, not really? Okay. Third question. What do they type So first? they have to type at number three. I've been paying attention. Very good. Have you ever been to Wyoming? And that doesn't, your answer will not necessarily dictate whether you win or not. That's right. It's just so yes, no. Not. Yes, no. And this time the prize will be an e-book or audio of one of the Maggie prequels. Of the Old. Here you go, Anna. I think it's starting to rain out there. We need some rain. I'm really messing this up. Oh, that's pretty. So the Maggie prequels happened... Um, actually, one of them was... A, this was a USA Today bestseller, so if, it's special. If you haven't read them, I think Buckle Bunny is... Outstanding. I think Buckle Bunny is really, I mean, I think all of books are outstanding, but Buckle Bunny is You have to is, say that. It's really good. Buckle yeah. Bunny, I, that's fun to write. It's so many. Um, and it's Hank. when she was young, and it's a, a flashback to when she met Hank, and how she met Hank, and then the second of the prequels is basically a flashback to how she lost Hank, and then that, then you get to um, the novels, which uh, are 15 years later. Mm -hmm. So it's fun. It's fun to go back and do that. So anyway, that is the third prize. Now, what were you supposed to remind me um, that I was going to talk about? Writing it true. Writing it true. Okay. So we have three daughters and two sons. Blended family. Eric and I have been married for 15 years. So he's got three. I've got two. Like that. Something like that. And um, when our oldest daughter turned 21, she gave us a card that said, Congratulations! No, she turned 20. Congra congratulations on um, me never being a pregnant teenager. That's just her personality, and we laughed really hard and thought it was funny. Then I started thinking about that I wanted to have a pregnant teenager in a book, and I thought, oh, gosh, I can't do that because what if it came true? And I started to develop this phobia about if I wrote something, it would become true. Obviously, I wasn't scared enough about it because I did write a book where I killed the husband in the second chapter, when I was mad at Eric, and he's still with us. But anyway. True story. That is true. So it came time to write Livewire, and I'd gotten a little bit lackadaisical about this not writing it true thing. And I included my horse, Katniss, under the name Lily. I included my dog, Louise, under the name Blank. Um, <laughs> Blank -er. Blank -er. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and then uh, I, I let it fly. 
Well, before the book was published, Louise died. Bad stuff, right? One month after the book was published, there's a scene in Livewire where Lily the horse gets wrapped up in barbed wire and it nearly kills her. Guess what happened to Katniss? Exactly the same thing. It took her, it took us about six months to get her recovered. She's got lightning scars on her back legs. She still has a teeny hitch in her giddy up. Um, and I realized I had done that to my animals. Don't ever put anything in your books you're not willing to let happen, except for killing them. Kill your husband, he's okay. <laughs> Everything else you don't want to do. Exactly. Exactly. I think I need another sip of my refresca. Um, all right. So you go back to the um, outline. I'm going to check the comments and make sure that we are answering the questions presented to us. Is my mom a teacher or just being a mom? She was a teacher. You can tell, can't you? And a good Southern woman. So we don't say that word. When Eric um, met my mom, maybe for the first time, I, how many minutes until you let one fly? Oh, seconds. Seconds. It was horrifying. And so my parents weren't really enamored of him at first, mostly because of that. And now he's their favorite person in the world besides their grandchildren. So I don't say that word around them, and, and I'm not their favorite. But uh, Nandita wants a virtual tour. So Nandita, what we'll do is at the very end, we're gonna do a virtual tour. But I wanna wait because it'll make people really seasick and I wanna give them the chance to opt out <laughs> of the virtual tour. All right, so one of um, the things about Maggie is that she is not a girl's girl. She, is, she has a few best girlfriends, but for the most part, women don't love her. I can relate to this. I haven't had a lot of really most girlfriends in my life so that part was easy for me to write but the animals seem to see right through it and Maggie does seem to have a way of the animals really seeing the good in her seeing past the F word <laughs> better than my mother does um, and uh, honey were you turning that page for a particular reason yeah because you had already consumed everything on the first man we're doing so page. good You're right on time am I yeah. okay cool 26 minutes into okay. it on second page You're if I was by myself, this would not be nearly as much fun. I want to tell you guys something Please funny speak. about Eric, because actually I think we're about four minutes ahead, just ahead of schedule. And that is, I'm currently, um, my current series that's out is actually a, a book for next year with Pulpwood Queens, and that's the Patrick Flint series, and the first book is called Switchback. So a couple of years ago, we were up in the mountains here, and oh my God. <laughs> I, <that's> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this story, and I snapped a picture of him looking at the ground, and at the time, I just was snapping a picture because he's cute, and I always snap pictures of him, but it turned out really hot. So my assistant said, oh, that's totally a book cover. And I said, well, if I wrote romance, and she's like, no, I think everybody'd love it. But well, it wasn't high res enough, so we couldn't use it for a book cover. But we got ready to enter the fray of the um, Brave New World of online advertising, and I needed an image for the Patrick Flint books. And I said, what about that hot picture of Eric up in the mountains? There's been like... 20,000 um, shares and comments on this picture of Eric now. He's like a social media star. I, I, every day I read him the comments about, you know, like the, the tagline on the ad says it's impossible to put down. You just don't even want to go there with the things people are saying. So anyway, it's very funny. And, um, and now he's offering his services as a male model if anybody needs him. No, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> but Nandita said she's only kidding. We don't have to do that dizzifying tour. Okay, so what we're going to talk about next is basically adventure. Because I believe when I'm writing a book, you know, I'm doing mystery, thriller, suspense. I like to make it really deep into the setting and the culture. And so whatever the setting is, I want the setting to be part of what raises the tension, right? So my theory of writing is that on page one, you have a protagonist who is at some level of happy or unhappy, and then you flog them to death until you reach the end of the book. So each page should be more and more traumatic for that, um, for that protagonist. And so you really use um, the, uh, the setting to help you do that. And so in order to do that, you have to really know the places that you're writing about, which I think is one of the reasons I really pick places that are close to me. I, my first series I wrote, uh, or my first trilogy, was in the U.S. Virgin Islands where we used to live in our earlier adventures, and we met. 
and then I wrote a second one there, and then I um, uh, wrote some that were set uh, on a quarter horse racing ranch in New Mexico. Um, I've got. Um, I was Michelle. Just, I was looking at the yeah. Sorry. Oh. Michelle, which started in Houston. And... Started in Houston, but they were triathletes, which was something Eric and I were really into for a while. But I try to pick an area and an activity that I know enough about that with a little research I can get away with um, creating an adventure around. And so with Maggie, and, and the other thing I like to do is, is make the protagonist a fish out of water. Yes. So that I don't have to make her the expert in these things, but instead, just like you and me, the person that is maybe terrified by whatever this adventurous thing is that happens to them. Like, for instance, with Maggie, it's getting up and riding a giant horse that she's never been on before. And ultimately, in Livewire, she has to be able to, um, to ride that horse um, more than once um, or bad things will happen and get over those fears. So those adventures are things that I embrace. One of the series that I wrote, the one that was on the ranch in New Mexico, involved um, sex trafficking, human trafficking, the whole um, trilogy did. And I went to a certification course to be a volunteer with people that had been rescued from um, sex trafficking, minor uh, females in particular, and used equine and art therapy to help them get over the experience. And so we try to do things that are immersive like that for each of the books. And that's what we did with Maggie, is we really threw ourselves, we went up and did a camping trip that was a month long up in the mountains up here. We took our horses. Eric had never ridden a horse before we got his horse. It was a year before that that we got the horse, so he had a little bit of time to practice. But we took our big ponies up into the mountains and basically turned ourselves loose with our dogs and just kind of let it fly to see what would happen and came back with a lot more appreciation for how to write some of the scenes. There have been times when I have been in book clubs where people have said, I don't think that place really existed. We talked about this before you got here. I, or, I don't think this really happened <laughs> or this couldn't happen. It's like, I love that about reading your reviews where it, you know, most of your reviews, you get a, a lot of feedback about how authentic you, you're, you're, re, you're writing about something that you know, but occasionally you'll get someone that says, I am this and that, and I know that there is no way that that could possibly happen. And I'm thinking as I read this, well, it actually did it happen. It did happen. Exactly like that. Because I did it. <laughs> but there was one, um, so the book I killed Eric in was called Going for Kona. And that's the Michelle Lopez Hansen trilogy out of, out of the um, uh, What Doesn't Kill You series, super series. And so if you want to read about me killing Eric, that's the one. But in that, the couple does um, endurance triathlons together. And I did it from the experience of having done endurance triathlons. And it's because all I knew was the way I'd done it. I just wrote my experience, my bicycle, my training schedule, my this, my that. Oh man, somebody ripped me up about the impossibility of that particular bike and that. It would never happen. I was like, except that it did. But we didn't say anything. We just let that person have their moment. Um, but that same thing happened with the newest series, the Patrick yeah, Flint series. Horse, horse people. A few, oh, the horse people. A few horse people have jumped in and said no. And well, it's funny. <laughs> they, they, okay, we've had people come out both ways. At the end of one of my books, a horse is injured. And that horse recovers. Okay, so animal lovers, it's going to be okay. One horse does die. But the important horse recovers. And, um, and so... We had to pick a way for it to be survivable, the injury, but yet a way for it to be implausible, improbable, but yet still possible, right? That's the sweet spot to me for mystery, thriller, and suspense. If it was probable, then that'd be just like real life, right? And my real life would be super boring to read about most yeah, of the time. Yeah. I don't know. Sometimes it'd be fun, but I don't know. It's most of the time, it wouldn't be. And so I'm looking for that tiny sliver of almost not possible, but still is. And so there were people saying, that is so unlikely, it would never happen. Well, we consulted with veterinarians, and we sat there and talked about, okay, this is really unlikely. They'd probably put a bullet in this horse's head, but it is possible that they could get this horse down and save it. So anyway, we just laugh at the... We laugh at the haters. Haters going to hate and um, continue to do 
really both of us are research and we're lucky because we've got in the family pilots, doctors, um, we've got veterinarians, we've got outdoorsmen, law enforcement, uh, friends that are judges, all the things we need. I'm an attorney and um, that really helps with coming up with the things that we need. Um, and so I think that it's time for the fourth question, don't you? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. And then, and then yeah, getting into Patrick for and why you wrote Patrick. Mm, okay. There is, I have to say, there was a question, a few questions about oh. where do I see the picture? Oh, but. the picture. <laughs> oh, Sorry. should I post it? Should I post? I should. No, I don't think you should say uh, that. I should post it. Um, I can't do it yet. I'll post it in Pulpit Academy. And I'll do the one that has the the new ad. Yeah. I, there's kind of a double entendre in that. I'll tell you about it later. Um, anyway, so I'll um, I'll put a um, picture of Eric in the ad. He also was in another ad campaign, a national ad campaign for oh, a gosh. women's in. Was it no, in you keep going there. It's not that it was rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> I keep thinking it's incontinence, but it wasn't. It was rheumatoid arthritis. He had to run shirtless on the beach. It was awesome. Okay, so fourth question. So write number four, and what is the question, darling? Yeah, it's very appropriate. <laughs> Would you kill off your loving husband in a book if you were writing mysteries? Just kidding. The real question is, so write number four, and what is the silliest pet name you've ever heard or given to an animal? I think in terms of the Foofy. blank -er. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the winner will get the entire Emily, the, the Emily Bernal box set, which is that... One I was telling you about earlier where it's set in New Mexico and West Texas and um, uh, the trilogy is based upon human trafficking. But it's really funny. I know that does that sounds incongruous, but it's really funny. It is. Yeah. And it's silly pet name and it doesn't have to be your own pet. Right. Whatever it can be any pet name. Yes, negative Nancy in every crowd. Thank you, Brooklyn. All right. So I had said I was going to talk about... Oh. Why did you write Patrick? Okay, so, all right, so with respect to what I'm writing now, it is, it is both Patrick and not Patrick. For the last year, my life has been all about one character, one family, and one only. Oh my gosh, Lizzie Borden for a pet, that's scary. <laughs> um, oh, <man. laughs> Vanessa. Um, I hope that was like a hamster. <laughs> <laughs> An axe-wielding hamster, <laughs> yeah. Um, so my dad, about 14 months ago, who is my hero and is only set with the time of 72 which i think is young every year i think it's younger um he's a doctor we he, he was a doctor uh down the road here in buffalo wyoming and um, he got a diagnosis of three months to live with cancer and it just kind of for me made me feel like i needed very very quickly to write a book with him as the protagonist and the kind of book that he would want to read and be able to put it in his hands and him know that he was totally fiction worthy, book worthy. I had to be writing something because that's what I do. For those of you that write, you know what I mean. You write every day, you sit down and you're going to do it whether it's you know the grocery list or uh, whatever. So I started writing, and first I asked him what he liked to write. I already knew what he liked, uh, or liked to read, which I already knew, because <laughs> for all these years I've been writing, he, instead of reading my books, kept giving me the books that he would like, and I liked them too. They just weren't what was coming out of me. I was writing female protagonists, and he liked Joe Pickett. Has anybody here ever read Joe Pickett? It's a C.J. Box character. I think it's like 18 books long in the series now. I love these books, and they're based here, right where we live. And they are about a man that's a little bumbling, but he manages always to get the job done, even though his wife's smarter than he is and his kids are sharper than he is. And they, and they finally his all... Friend is, his, his friend is stronger and handsomer. <laughs> and so they, they get it all done. And, um, and it really celebrates the outdoors. And so I knew that's what he liked. And so I said, okay, Dad, I'm going to, with your permission, I'm going to write these books with Patrick Flint. My dad's name's Peter Fagan. Patrick Flint and family set in the 1970s when we lived here. And then I wrote Like the Wind, just as fast as I could possibly write. And he had three months. He had three months. And I finished it with his consultation because there were medical issues. He was in a, a doctor out in the wilderness. And he kind of enjoyed it. And then I didn't even think I was going to release it. But 
like, well, I'm an indie author. I have a book sitting here. It may never sell a single copy, but what the heck? Oh, holy cow. This book has just gone Too! because people like to read Joe Pickett, it turns out, and they like to read Patrick Flint. So I started writing as fast as I could more books. Meanwhile, my dad's kicking cancer's butt. He is defying the odds. He's going to all these alternative treatments. He's being totally Patrick Flint. And I am now done with the fourth book in the series. It's been 14 months. I've never written so fast in my life. My, my brain hurts. My brain really hurts. But he now loves it. He loves telling his friends uh, that he's Patrick Flint. He loves seeing, he'll come to me with ideas. You know, I was thinking that that big horn, rig, you know, regatta, rig, whatever it's called, I can't even remember, uh, the ride, the oh, big ride, oh. that would make a good story. Yes. And what about, you know, and poses, and, and I think Patrick would, and it's become really fun. So if you ever get a chance to write books about your dad, then um, I highly recommend it. So those have been a lot of fun. They were actually the books that um, got me and this wonderful guy, Joe, in our lives, uh, my agent. But the book I'm writing now um, actually came about because of Patrick Flint and because of that agent. So let's do the last contest, and then I'll tell that story, and then we'll start wrapping things up. Yeah. And yeah? Oh, because... Well, I didn't mention this earlier, but I do a weekly video cast podcast where I interview other authors, and I have really learned that going too long is a cardinal sin, and we've already gone longer than I usually go. So, fifth question. Oh, did you have something first? No, I was just I was going to say that you know a lot of the Patrick stories. What I, what's, I think is so cool about them is that it's it's really a strung together a whole lot of vignettes, the mystery you've created, but a lot of the scenes are real scenes, and so you can sit down with your dad and talk through those scenes. And, some are, and, and you might, you know, tell them one, one of the animals in the parking lot or, or maybe the, the cowboy that he met or, you, okay. you know, something like that. But just Real I think they're, they're two stories. bringing it to reality. The, the way that this became the diary of Peter Fagan slash Patrick Flint and the thing people seem to love about the books. Um, when my dad was a doctor here in the 1970s, he had this young rodeo cowboy that was, came in for a broken ankle. His name was Chris. And Chris said, Doc, strap me up. I, I got a ride this weekend. And Dad said, oh, Chris, that's a bad idea. You need to stay off this ankle. And so he put a cast on him. And the next week, Chris comes in, and that cast is toast. And so they had to, again, put the cast on. And every week for the rest of the season, um, Dad put a new cast on this guy's ankle. Well, has anybody ever heard of Chris Ledoux? Chris Ledoux was the national bronc riding champion the year that he was busting his ankle over and over and bringing it back to my dad. And he also was famous for being a country music star who Garth Brooks partnered with. And um, I can't remember the name of the song, but um, lo a worn out tape of Chris Ledoux, Lonely yeah. Women and Bad Booze, The Only Things That Keep Me Hanging On. Well, the white line's getting longer. Good. And this is something, something. I'm much too young <laughs> to feel this damn old, old. Yeah. <laughs> and can't remember anything as a result. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, um, so Chris Ledoux um, turned out to be this guy. So, we included that vignette in the stories. The other thing, this one to me always resonated is being a doctor in Wyoming in the 1970s didn't mean just being a doctor. One night, my dad got a call early on in his tenure from the uh, lab tech at the hospital and said, Doc, we've got to broken leg in here. You need to get up here as fast as you can. There's a bad break. So my dad comes in and he goes running in the hospital and the guy says, what are you doing, doc? The patient's out in the parking lot. And my dad said, why, why would you leave him out there? And he said, because it's a horse, Dr. Fagan. I mean, come on, doc. And my dad was like, a horse? What are you talking about? And it turned out the vet was out of town. And whenever the vet was out of town, the doctors had to cover for the vet. So my dad set, <laughs> casted horses and did a bunch of vet stuff, which he loved doing. My mother didn't love Wyoming so much. And so anyway, uh, we left Wyoming after a few years and moved back to Texas. And it took me a long time to get back here. All right, fifth question. Now, I'm going to do a number five, and then your answer. If you have a mother or father that you dearly love, type mother or father, or whoever that person is in your life that made a huge di enough difference to you, that if you had the chance to write a mystery in three months, you would have done it. So it could be aunt, uncle, grandparent, brother, sister, coach, teacher, clergy person, step-parent, you name it. 
whoever it is, and that will suffice to be your entry to win the newest Patrick Flint book, which isn't even out in ebook form yet, but it'd be an ebook form, and it's called Scapegoat. And I'll shoot that one over to you if you're the winner of that question. So now, last segment of the, sh of the show, the event, the Pulpwood Academy event of Pamela and Eric yapping in their dining room. Um, so as you can tell, we're in this lodge. And as I mentioned earlier, as a result of the Patrick Flint books, I ended up with something I never aspired to have, and that was an agent. I was kind of anti-establishment, like Red Bull. And um, did you like that? That was pretty cool. Okay, thank you. And okay. uh, <laughs> that was more him than me, the Rebel. But I was anti-establishment about publishing. And because I then had some um, monetary uh, and critical and... Uh, ranking success, um, bestseller success. Without it, I was kind of cocky. I don't need, I don't need an agent. Well, the, an agent has come into my life and promised me that he wants to help me retire young and make a lot of money. So he is trying to do that. So what he said was, write me a new book. And I'm like, in my spare time, I'm cranking them out as fast as I can. But he said, I have a book I want you to write. And I think that after having been on with Eric and I for mm, 45 minutes, you'll find this funny. He said, picture this a Houston area couple. Let's say she's a former attorney that wants to be a writer of mysteries. And her husband, maybe he's a refugee from the oil industry, or maybe he's something more interesting, oh. a veterinarian. They accidentally end up in Wyoming on a mountainside with a bed and breakfast. That the football bar. What? The football star. I'll tell them that in a second. Um, and, and they move to Wyoming where said recovering attorney writes mysteries, but she writes them as they're happening in real life, kind of like Murder, She Wrote, but in Wyoming and a little grittier, set in a lodge with this couple, and these dead bodies just magically keep appearing, and she has to write the mysteries, but she's also involved in solving them, and they're all wrapped up. You know, they have little animals everywhere, like, oh, grab him, grab that little animal that's snorting oh. over there. You know, they have a pet skunk, and they, whatever, Aaron, the, the man, rescues that week, and, you know, is it a little baby deer or whatever? And I said, Joe... This is this would be one of these critters. This is our blind Boston Terrier. Ooh, that's the bad side. Show your pretty side. Okay. Hi, sweetheart. Team Petey. Um, and so basically, I said, Joe, that sounds really familiar, except that there are no dead bodies where we live, and thank you. And he goes, no, it'll be great. Trust me, write that book. I said, that's not my idea. It's your idea. He said, trust me, write that book. So... He said, give me 50 pages. And I said, that's not how I do things, Joe. I write the whole book, and then Eric critiques it, and then we go back and forth. And he said, do it however you want to do it, but write me that book. And then I'm going to sell that book. So we're almost finished. We are turning it in at two in two weeks with the first Jen Harrington mystery, which is set at the Bighorn Lodge. And the husband is a former... Um, uh, he's a veterinarian, but he's a former football player that got beat out of his quarterback spot at Tennessee by Peyton Manning. And so he's had kind of a chip on his shoulder ever since about not getting to be the one that calls the plays. And so it, it's, a, it's a fun uh, mystery, and we're really, really uh, looking forward to it. So. And Patrick runs through the book, and Maggie and Hank oh, run yeah, through Maggie's the book. In it. And you know, so there's a Maggie connection back to it. Maggie Maggie actually Hank. is big in this book because yeah. she and Jennifer do not get along at all, and yet Maggie is the one that can shock Jennifer into recognizing the flaws in herself. So Maggie comes back, Patrick Flint comes back, it pulls all my worlds together, and um, it's a lot of fun. So I am, as I said, I'm busily at work on that. And honey, can you think of anything we didn't cover that was on our outline? So we actually had an outline because that's what we do. As we make outlines, and um, I do. By the way, I'm not a pants or writer. I'm an outliner. Uh, that would be no surprise after that. Anything else? Did I miss it? The only thing you missed, you kind of covered it, but it's just why are you doing this? How did you get into this? Why are you writing? I... My third grade teacher here in Buffalo, Wyoming, told my parents I would be a novelist. To which I said, No, I like to read books, not write them. I'm sure some of you can relate to that. You're you kind of, you're kind of both, or you kind of feel both. You lean more towards one than the other. I still read way more than Eric would like, and 
um, late into the night after he falls asleep. I'm still reading. Um, but <laughs> that's what started it. And I'd written a whole lot of partial books by the time I um, met Eric. And when we got married, he said, what do you want to be when you grow up? Wasn't those exact words, but I can't remember what close they were. It's close. To which I was offended and thought, well, I think I've accomplished a lot. And I'm fully actualized and formed. And he said, no, what dreams haven't you fulfilled that I can make possible for you to go after? That's a totally different thing, right? And it was one of the reasons I love him very much, one of many. And um, I said, okay, I want to write a marathon. And I want to write a novel. So on our first anniversary, we ran the marathon and then five more and then a bunch of half iron men's and stuff. And then he said, okay, where's the damn book? I'm like, oh crap, because that's a much scarier thing. That's a, that's a fear of failure thing. If I write it and it's awful, then I failed. But he went on a trip to India. He goes on, a, he used to go on a lot of international trips pre-COVID. And while he was gone, I wrote 20,000 words as fast as I can. It became the book Saving Grace. Um, which has done over two million copies in print. Um, so it's, ah, I guess there was something to it. But at the time, it was just a joke. It was, here, damn it, I wrote the book and handed it to him. And, um, and then he said, go, Pamela, go. This is good. So that's what I did. And here we are, how many years later? Twelve years later after that and, and talking about, books? well, I just... It's, uh, well, I just I'm publishing the nineteenth. I'm finishing the twentieth, and I've got the next two queued up and outlined. You didn't count them. the nonfiction. Oh, I didn't count the nonfiction. There's six of those, seven of those. I need a break. <laughs> I need to slow down. I'm going to, but I will tell you that as an indie writer, um, it, it's a little different from traditional, where publishers want to keep you. Yes, Brooklyn, he is every woman's hero. And believe me that when you see the ad, if you ever follow it, the people that comment it are like, he's not just my hero, he's my hunka hunka. Anyway, um, but it is very different in traditional publishing. They want you at a pace that matches what they can publish and promote. And that's about one a year. Or if you're a romance writer, sometimes it's a lot faster. But I'm not, I'm a mystery thriller writer. And my friends that write traditionally mystery thriller come out with one a year, I come out with four. I need, I need a vacation from my life. <laughs> but once you, once you figured out how to do that pace, it's hard ever to stop. So now I'm going to tell you what the big prize is going to be. The big prize is going to be that I'm going to go back through. Like I said, I'm going to wait to come back and comment you to let you know whether you've won or not and how to collect your prize, ebook or audio of the books that I talked about to the extent I have audio. A few of them I don't. Um, but I'm going to give it a few days because a lot of, the Pulpit Academy is going to see this on replay. And we're going to give everybody time to participate. And then after I picked those winners, which I promise will be fair, but I don't know how to randomize, so there may be a lot of winners. A lot of winners, <laughs> because I'll feel bad, um, is somebody's going to get the whole set. Somebody's going to get all 19. So I'm not even going to tell you what the criterion is for that, because it may just be that I like let my dog <laughs> you know, like put his paw on it or something. But someone's going to get all 19, which means basically you'll do nothing but be my best friend for a year as you read those books. Yay! That's all we've got. This has been really fun. I really appreciate the, um, uh, Eric, you're a real sport. Man, is he ever. You, I, I, I haven't you even told tell, you about the stories about it. I thought you were going to tell the other the underwear camping story. story. No. What? Oh, the other camping story where you... When you were going off on how we were... Okay, one yeah. more story because we've got like a few minutes. Um, Y'all want another story. And they're like, yes, shut up, shut lady. Up. <laughs> shut up and go away. Um, so we were camping that month we were camping. We, were, we camped backcountry. We don't go to campsites or campgrounds. There are rules here in Wyoming about how and where you can camp on virgin ground, if you will, and that's what we did. And we had a um, tape fence, an electric fence with a battery charged or solar powered, um, solar powered uh, electrical charge for the fence. It's five in the morning, one morning, and it's 30 something degrees outside because you're up way in the mountains. So it was 9,500 feet. And Eric went out to answer the call of nature in nothing but his t-shirt and his flannel pants. And we're out in the middle of the wilderness, guys, and so Eric comes back in, he is ashen, ashen, and he's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I said, what is it? And he slams the door, and he said, 
I had not yet pulled up my pants, I turned around and there was a female backpacker standing right behind me walking past out here in the middle of nowhere. And I just kept dying laughing. I'm like, oh, you made her trip, honey. She's going to tell that story forever. And he's like, no, I, I think I offended her. And I'm like, it's going to be okay. Knocking came on the door. And he's like, oh, God, she's come. She's come to say how mad she is and how upset she is. And I said, nah, she's probably coming to get your phone number. You hear that? When you knock on the door, all the dogs come. And Eric is running away because this is, embarrasses him. Anyway, we are trying to decide who's going to answer the door, and this FEMA voice goes, horses are out, which I thought was a euphemism, <laughs> but it wasn't. <laughs> Our horses were really out. They were loose. They'd come out of their fence. <laughs> Dogs are not going to get over me knocking. And so, anyway, I think I included that in a uh, Patrick Flint book or something like it, the switchback, because that story was just too funny. Any, she stayed and helped us put the horses up, and Eric never looked her in the eye, not one single time. It is, it is in switchback. <laughs> it is, yeah, it's in switchback. So I just love having a good sport in the family. Say goodnight, good sport. Oh, do we have? Just check. Checking. Thank you for having us, everybody here at Pulpwood Academy. Thank you to Brooklyn. Thank you to Kathy. You guys are awesome. I can't tell you how much fun both of us had at our first Pulpwood Queen's Girlfriend weekend, and we're looking forward to next time. Until then. There's always video. Night, everybody.